What about you? Do you, can you see my screen now? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I do. Yeah. So, I mean, so inventory in SCCM is what, what we want to talk about today. And it, it's all about how inventory works within SCCM, uh, how to configure properly, things to watch out for. And then mo most especially if we have any questions regarding that, one of the things that that will encourage is that any question on your mind regarding that, no matter how, how silly it may sound, just ask it no matter what, you know. Okay. So the goal is that if none of us know the answer, at least we have that question in our mind, yes. it will drive us to go find the answer. <laughs> and then we can we can share it later. So that, that's like the main goal. So in terms of inventory in SCCM, I mean, all, all, all this while we've been talking about uh, the old framework of SCCM being uh, systems management. You're able to manage the systems within your uh, environment or within your data center. So whether it's client, whether it's servers, you can manage them. You can manage their entire life cycle from the time you commission a client or from the time that you commission a, a server till the time that you decommission that client or server, you can use SCCM to basically manage um, that device for its entire life cycle. And by management, that um, includes, um, if you want to do um, operating system, you want to deploy an operating system to it, uh, you want to, sorry, I'll just, yeah, so you want to deploy an operating system to it, you want to, um, set up uh, software to it uh, you want to install software to it you want to keep those softwares updated you want to um, make sure that your underlying operating system is updated you um, want to manage the inventory you want to manage the configuration you want to make sure that it's in it's in compliance whatever whatever policy that you have in your environment um, SSM will take that device from the very first time you bring it in, where you have to deploy an operating system to it, to the very time that you decommission it completely, and SSM can manage it through the entire life cycle. And one of the important um, facts, one of, or one of the important benefits of that, of SSM, is the fact that it's one of the go-to places, or one of the places that you can refer to if you need to get information about devices in your environment. So um you want to get any i mean basically you want to get any kind of information about adwares running in your environment i mean like more recently like uh, at work like we're talking about some windows 10 features and we're talking about so there's this windows 10 uh, new windows 10 form of authentication called the hello have you heard of that before you may need to unmute yourself whenever you want to talk. So I mean, the reason why I muted this is to avoid the noise, the background noise. So you may need to, so just feel free to unmute yourself. Have you heard about the Windows 10 Hello before? No. Windows 10 Hello. So it's kind of like a new, um, so let's see, uh, Windows 10 Hello. <laughs> Um, uh, I never heard about oh, it. Yeah, sorry, it's called Windows Hello. That's it. Um, Windows Hello. So it's kind of like a, put, a, a way to do authentication without the password in Windows. So which is one thing that Microsoft uh, is one of the um, one of the new things that they are pushing in Windows with Windows 10. It's called Windows Hello, and then, cause, but one of the prerequisites to implementing this properly is you have to have hardware. Or, for example, like even the one, if you go to the community, somebody asked a question about some of the new features again. If you go to Google Plus and you go under the community page, and then somebody asked about another feature of Windows 10. So, community under the MCSC group, and then you see under so scroll down scroll down yeah okay here we go can anyone demo how to add isolated user mode for me or link me to a video for it i know it's a windows 10 enterprise feature and how do i use it so again this is another new feature for windows 10 isolated user mode which is kind of like security um, 
it's it's kind of like a security feature for Windows 10 Enterprise. And this guy just goes into like the technical details and all that stuff. But again, the what the person is saying is that there's no demonstration for this. But one of the things is that, uh, and the reply that we gave was that well, one of the reasons why there's no demonstration for it is because for you to implement this, you you have to have hardware that supports TPM version two. So somebody somebody mentioned to me, I've not confirmed that you can implement it on hardware that supports TPM version 1.2, but it's not supported by Microsoft. But what Microsoft recommends is that you have to have hardware that supports a minimum of TPM version 2. So oh. yeah, carry on, Tyler. Yeah, what's TPM? So TPM, Trusted Platform Module. So on your computer, so on, on, on your computer hardware, um, you have a chip on the machine so that chip can store security information so that's what bitlocker uses bitlocker oh. can work without the tpm so the way just to give you like a um, a rough overview just a, a high level overview so this may not be fully technically accurate right so mm -hmm. give you an overview Taiwo. so this is your machine right this is your tpm chip on the machine and you have your hard drive here now you want to encrypt this hard drive, right? Now, when you encrypt this hard drive, you have to have the decryption key, right? Mm -hmm. So let, let's get an in the small box here. Let's say this is the key that used to encrypt this hard drive. So that means whenever you want to use this hard drive, you have to be able to decrypt this hard drive to be able to use it, right? So mm -hmm. where will you store the key that you're using to encrypt this hard drive? You can store it on a USB, right? Yes. Is that secure? Because if the USB gets lost, I have access to the key, right? Right? It's like nope. a typical so yeah, I do. Because if if you store this key on a USB and I find that USB, that means I can read the information on this drive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or um or another thing that could happen is I I um I, I tell that key to Taiwo, right? That okay, Taiwo just keep the key in your head. Now if some if Taiwo tells somebody what that key is, I have access to information on it on this hard drive, right? But what you can do is rather than knowing what the key is, storing it on a USB, your machine can store it on a TPM chip on your machine. So you have no idea what that key is, but whenever you want to log into your machine, it will retrieve the key from the TPM and use it to unlock this drive. Hmm. So this this place, there's absolutely no way you're gonna get the key out of this. This chip, because it's a hardware device that's on the machine. So in case the key is lost and that's all, everything so, is on. Yes, but the thing is, this this is a hardware that's on the machine. So it's not something that you can steal the key from. It's something that's locked in here on the machine. So even you have no idea what the key is, Taiwo has no idea what the key is. It's not on a USB somewhere. It's on a hardware chip somewhere. So good luck hacking the hardware. Mm -hmm. So you said it's on the hardware. Yeah. So let's say I wipe out my OS. Yeah. The key still remain. Yes, because again, this is not on the hardware at all. This is on the motherboard. Sorry, this is not on the this is not related to the OS at all. This is on the motherboard. So it's it's just a chip on the motherboard yeah. that you can use to store security information. Yes, I am in class. Yeah. One of the other things that you can do with this is you, you've probably seen this before with BitLocker, is you can do boot protection. Mm -hmm. And what that means is um Taiwan's encrypted its hard drive, right? With BitLocker. Mm. With BitLocker. Okay, so why what, what I want to do is I want to be able to at least give myself an opportunity to attack this drive, see if I can hack it, right? Even though mm. it's encrypted, I want to give myself the opportunity to see if I can attack it. So what I can do is I can go into the BIOS and say, hey, before because if I boot straight to this hard drive, it's gonna tell me, hey. You need a pin to be able to enter, right? So what I can do is I can go to the BIOS and say, um, I want you to boot first with the um, DVD, right? 
So then if I boot with the DVD, then at least I can have a chance to start attacking this hard drive, right? Mm -hmm. But what you can do is that you set your boot order to say, after you um, encrypted your drive, so you say, the first thing I want you to boot with is the ad, always the hard drive, not the DVD. Mm -hmm. But then after you do this, your machine will take a hash of your BIOS configuration and then store it on this TPM chip. So that if anybody goes into the BIOS and changes this and says it's no longer hard drive DVD, it's now DVD hard drive, your TPM chip will go, no, um, your, your machine will go, something has changed in the BIOS configuration. Therefore, I'm going to require you to enter a long 64 digit uh, recovery key before you can proceed. I'm mm. not sure if that's clear at all. Yeah, we use uh, the the McAfee one, the McAfee safe boot at work. Yeah. It's, it's almost like uh, we are going to implement a bit lock bit locker, next. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. So, for example, like you can see this, a, trusted, a TPM is a specialized chip on an endpoint device that stores RSC encryption keys specific to the old system for the hardware authentication. So again, one of the benefits of this Taiwo is this, is that if I go to your, if, I, if I'm able to steal your machine and I take out this hard drive from your machine, it's useless to me. Because where's the key that will unlock it? It's tied to the machine, right? So you taking this hard drive out of this machine, you're just you're just disturbing yourself because the key that can unlock this thing is tied to this machine. So if you want to unlock it, it has to be on this machine. Hmm. I'm not sure, Taiwo. I'm not sure is that if that is that yeah. that no, gives you I, like a high I, level overview. No, no, I do get it. That's yeah. like the key is the private key. Yes. The hardware is the private key. So without that, it's useless. Exactly. So that's it. So just a chip on your machine. So the key, all the key are stored there. And good luck. In fact, there was one documentation. I uh, CIA, this CIA TPM. So there was one documentation that I was reading online about, um, about CIA computer. Um, policy. So one of the policies, I'm not sure, is it CIA or um, is, it, is it CIA CIA policy TPM? Um, um, ah, okay, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so basically, like um, the US, okay, sorry, USDOD, maybe not CIA. USDOD, the Department of Defense Computer Policy. And if you, you can think you can read what your computer or computer and computing equipment policy is online. And one of the things that, that I, cause one day I was just looking around for information on TPM and I saw this and I was like, ah, this is interesting. <laughs> if it opens up. Um, and basically, what what he basically says is, hey, there will be no equipment for Department of Defense if it doesn't support, um, if it doesn't support the, if it doesn't have a TPM chip. Ah, okay, I think here, here it is. Uh, Memorandum for Secretaries of the Military Department, Joint of Chief Staff, Under Secretaries of Defense, and stuff and stuff like that. And yeah, can you see this? Is this, I'm not sure if this is clear. Can you see number four? In anticipation of emerging encryption. Product capabilities, as well as requirement for device authentication, DOD components shall ensure all new computer assets procured to support the DOD enterprise include a TPM version 1.2 or higher, where such technologies are available. Reading justification must be provided to the responsible designated approving authority if assets are procured without TPM technology in cases where it is available. So basically, you're saying, hey, you have to, whatever equipment you're buying for DOD has to have a TPM chip, otherwise you must have a very good reason and stuff. So it's basically like just more, more, more security in terms of like, you know, 
it's easy, it's more difficult to hack a hardware, right, than it is to hack a software. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not as if it's not possible. There have been weaknesses. Actually, there was one here where they have been, um, let's see, where they've been concerns where people can do um, some sort of hacking against the hardware. Uh, where is that? Um, I think there was one where it says, yeah. So there's there was probably like a kind of like a method where you can basically try to, um, within a, a small space of time, you have to have access to the hardware and then spray it with some kind of, <laughs> with some kind. So basically, you have to be like a hardware engineer expert to try to hack this. Mm. So so this is going beyond software hacking. This is you're hacking a hardware device. So, uh, yeah, we digressed. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're like, okay, we want to implement this feature within our environment. And one of the things that we wanted to find out was how many machines in our environment support TPM2? Because if we're going to use this, and this, this is one of the requirements, how do we find that information? Well, um, thank God for SCCM. So, we were able to go to SCCM and pull up a report and say, what's the TPM version on all the machines? in this environment. Now you can't get that information from Active Directory, but we're able to pull it up from SCCM and we have we had like a quick report of, ah, okay, we only have six machines with TPM version two, all the rest are TPM version 1.2. So maybe we're not gonna be using this feature and stuff. So- Well, you should be able to pull it using PowerShell. From the machines. Yes, yeah. it is possible. It is, it is possible. So it is possible to pull it using PowerShell. So um, as a matter of fact, like if I go, I think I'm running Windows 10 now with PowerShell version. They have actually have like new commandlets. Get um, command. They have new commandlets for TPM. Ah, uh, yeah. So you can use that. You even have new commandlet for TPM. I think in PowerShell oh. version five. Yeah. Right. So here we go. So you have um, get TPM for example. So these are new command led for PowerShell version oh, 5. Windows 10. Yeah, on Windows 10. Or oh, I think you can install oh, PowerShell yeah. version 5 on... on... PowerShell version 5. Yeah. yeah. Uh, get TPM... Ah, okay, sorry. Access denied. I need to be running it as an administrator. And yeah, so you can either use this method or like the one that I mentioned. You can use um, just PowerShell with uh, WMI or SIM. So it's saying TPM present, yes. TPM ready, yes. Um, lockout count, okay, yeah. Not supported for. So you can see some of these are not supported for TPM version 1.2. I need a higher version of TPM, which is version 2, the latest version and stuff. So all no authorization and stuff like that. So, and then there's like much, much more. So you can pull it from PowerShell, that is true. Um, but I, I think it's just kind of like maybe much more easier uh, if you want to pull it from SCCM. So with PowerShell, how you probably do with PowerShell is you probably, one way I can think of is you probably write a script that will do all this query, right? And then run it as a scheduled task on the machine. So you can deploy a group policy that will have a scheduled task that will run on the machine gather the report right gather the information copy it to a file server somewhere and then you can see that information there so that's one way to to achieve that same thing yeah so so yeah so it's mainly like that's like one of the advantages of using SCM is you can um it's like a quick way to have like an inventory and it's something that will make you uh, really, really close to your managers because managers like reports. <laughs> they like <laughs> reports and pie charts and graphs. They're not into like a lot of stuff. All the ones is you come and say, I've got this report. Hey, we have 500 machines in the environment. Do you know that 200 of them are vulnerable to this? You know, and that kind of graph, you know, make this one red and make the other one green and that kind of stuff. So it's one of the advantages that we get from using SCCM is we can do inventory. Um, so there are three types of inventory in SCCM or three levels of inventory that you can do with SCCM. 
Does anyone know what they have? I'm sure Taiwan does. So does anyone know what the three levels of inventory have with ICCM? Mm. Anyone? Taiwan, you want to go for that? Sorry. Are you talking about um hardware and software? Yeah. yeah, that's right. So number one, we have hardware inventory. What other level of inventory do we have? The ability to do with ICCM. Um, software inventory. Software inventory. Yeah. Excellent. And what's the last one? Software. So no. Policy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's called asset intelligence. Oh, asset. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. So, what abilities do we have with hardware inventory? What what is hardware inventory gonna get for us? Uh, okay. we, I mean, we we'll get you all the com hardware configuration of your PC. Yeah. In memory, uh, hard disk space, Excellent. and other things like that. So basically, this is like a very interesting one because, I mean, if you look at the amount of information you can get from this, you will be surprised. You, for another good example that I can give to you is, okay, we have a Windows 10 project, right? Mm -hmm. We have a Windows 10 project. And we don't, you know, you won't just go, boom, let's upgrade every machine to Windows 10. Now we have a Windows 10 upgrade task sequence. Let's push it out to everyone. Because not every hardware in your environment are able to support Windows 10. Even though you may be able to install Windows 10 on them, that doesn't mean they are supported. And in an enterprise, you have to be careful about are they supported or not. Because one thing could be, uh, for example, uh, the manufacturers have stopped producing drivers for this hardware. So maybe mm -hmm. there are users using certain hardware in your environment that manufacturers are not producing hardware for at all. That's what they're not producing drivers for. So you install Windows 10 on it. Now, all of a sudden, the webcam is not working. The mouse is not working. You go to the manufacturer's website. They're like, hey, we have drivers for Dell 555. We have the driver for Windows 7. We have the driver for Windows 8, Windows 10 drivers. No, we don't care. We've forgotten about that hardware model. We've moved on. So one of the first things that we had to do was to pull up a report of every hardware model that is used by clients in our environment. And then basically went to the website of the manufacturer to see, are there Windows 10 drivers for this hardware? And then... Basically, I think like there's probably like about more than 20 models in our own environment that were not supported on Windows 10, that we could not move to Windows 10. So all those people and all those 20 hardware models, you know, again, how do you, how will we be able to get that information whenever managers are asking and saying, okay, you're doing this Windows 10 stuff. So what's the plan uh, for machines that are not, you know, how many machines do we even know that don't support Windows 10? Do we have any idea, you know, managers like those kind of things, they want the numbers. Do we have any idea how many machines, okay, hold on, we'll get it for you. So these are the hardware models, you know, um, so I think we have like over 2,000 machines, about 600 of them are on hardware that could not move to Windows 10. So about 600 of them, we can move them to Windows 10, so you either have to come up with a big budget <laughs> of changing uh, the hardware of these people, or we have to figure out a plan on what to do. So you get like lots of information. So what, what I was saying was that, you know, you get memory, you get hard drive, you get the model, you get the version of the BIOS. For example, uh, Taiwo, your security team comes to you and says, there's been a very um, huge vulnerability in this particular BIOS version on all Dell machines. Is, can we find out how many machines in our environment have this particular BIOS version installed. You know? I, you know, how do you get that quickly? So basically, just think about this. If anybody has you in your environment, can you get information relating to any hardware on any machine? I don't care what it is. The model of the hard drive, 
any information that they need on the machine you can get it from lccm do you know why we're confident to say that does anyone know the reason why that would you know the reason why we're confident to say that they say any hardware information that they need you can get it for them uh because um because SCCM has pulled all the information yeah. into the database. But well, why are we confident that SCCM will be able to like pull all this information or that the information will be available for SCCM to pull? Well, because uh, they're using uh, this uh, common internet uh, You're in SIM. the right direction, SIM. And what, what, mm -hmm. what does the SIM mean? It means it's a standard, right? Yeah. It same is a standard, so it's a standard by the DTMF or whatever. If I go sim or whatever or um, sim DT, DMTF, yeah. So it's a standard that has been agreed on to say whoever is creating, you know, any hardware driver manufacturer, you have to make this information available on the device using this method so because it's a standard you can be confident that so in other words if you're in the business of producing hard drives people must be able to read information about the model of the hard drive the speed of the hard drive you know management information about that hard drive from the operating system people must be able to read it it's one of the standards that you must follow so because of that we can be confident if anyone comes and says can we get information about this random thing that you've never thought about? You can be confident and say, I, I may not know how to get it now, but I'll look into that and I'm sure that we can get it with SCCM. So that's like in terms of hardware inventory. We'll talk about how that works in a minute. Then software inventory. Uh, okay, what else can we get from hardware inventory? Any other thing that we can get from hardware inventory? Uh, okay, Okay, let me bring this up. Let's go to ICCM first. Let me go to it. So one other thing that um could be confusing is that you know what? Hardware inventory is where you get software information also. Did you know that? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> so again if I go here, so I have this machine, right? Can you see the machine? L B D C two, right? If yeah. I right click on it and I click on start and I go on resource explorer and if I go under hardware, I expand hardware and I go down here and I go okay look at this this is interesting installed applications can you see that mm -hmm. that's under hardware inventory I can see installed applications I can see installed applications 64 bit I can see recently used applications on the hardware inventory. Why is that? Yeah, the reason, <laughs> good, good question, why is that? The reason is because it's called hardware inventory, but what it's just doing is, hardware inventory just simply means it's doing WMI queries. And what that means when we say it's doing WMI queries is that any information that you can get from WMI, you can get from hardware inventory. Because all hardware inventory is doing is it's just doing WMI queries. Whereas software inventory is not doing WMI queries, software inventory is doing file scanning. So it's scanning all the files on your machine and scanning file number one, file number two. For example, I can I have my machine here, right? I can query my machine using WMI to say, uh, sorry, not this one. Let me let me show you. Let me. Show, I can query my machine, um, and actually, this is a really interesting one for people that are doing SCCM. So let me make it the font bigger. Um, this one. Okay, and let's go. Let's clear screen. So WMI command line in Windows is called WMIC. So I go WMIC. Actually, let me let me open one this as an administrator. Yeah. So if I go WMIC products list. So this is just a WMI query using old Windows command line. 
WMIC product list and let's see what it gives to me. So you see the reason why this you like this as an SCCM administrator because um, have you ever wondered how do I find what the GUID is for this application? This is a good way. So use this method, you get the GUID for the application. Everything will be listed out for you in a nice way. You like it. So if that completes quickly, so it's yeah, it's just doing the query, return the query for me to uh, to me. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. So why why we wait for that to complete? So so anything that we can get from WMI, we can get from hardware inventory. So that's why you can see installed applications here. And you know where it's pulling this information from? Installed applications. It's pulling this from hardware remove programs in control panel. Oh. Which is more accurate actually than what you get from software inventory. Because and we'll, and we'll explain that because what software inventory would do is this software inventory will go to your machine and say, um, Can I find a file called uh, word.exe on your machine? Yes, I can find, find a file called word.exe. Let me read the information on this file. Oh, the information says this file, the name is Microsoft Word. So software inventory reports and says Taiwo has Microsoft Word on his machine. But this is not accurate, is it? No. Because Taiwo can have Word.exe on his machine without installing it. But software inventory, all it's doing is it's scanning for files and scanning for extension and reading the details section of the files. That's what software inventory is doing. Whereas hardware inventory is doing particular query. Give me a query of installed applications on this machine. Okay, here's the Okay, here we go. Okay, this is not really clear. Let me pipe that. Let me go. Let me clear screen. CLS clear screen. Let me pipe that into a text file. Let me call it wmake.txt. So I get that into a text file, then we open the text file. That will make it much, much better. But what Adware Inventory is doing is Adware, Adware Inventory is actually going and saying, hey, tell me applications that are installed. So it's querying WMI. WMI as a database. Tell me the applications that are installed on you. And WMI replies and says, here are the list, here's the list of the applications. So you can actually get more accurate information about the installed application from Adware Inventory than from Software Inventory. Have you ever wondered, for example, let's look at this. Hardware inventory, you have all this. Software inventory, let's go to um, not collected files. I'm not sure. Maybe I've not enabled it. Okay, yeah, it's not done anything. But have you ever done software inventory where you go to software and it's telling you that your machine has Windows XP, your machine has Windows Vista, your machine has uh, Windows 7 and Windows 10. Have you ever seen that before? Mm, not that, but I've seen um, one of um, Microsoft Office. Yeah. It will tell me, because yeah. I was trying to run a report one time when I was playing with it. Yeah. I thought Microsoft Word 2014. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Microsoft Word. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, which what's going on? Exactly. That is the issue whenever you're trying to use software inventory for. Uh, when, whenever you're trying to use software inventory for getting applications that are installed. Because what, what, the other thing that will happen is this, Taiwo. So Microsoft has come out with Office 2010, right? Or yeah. Office 2016. Now, what you don't know is that some of the files for Office 2016 are actually files from Office 2013. Yeah. So yeah. maybe let's say the file is uh, um, OFF dot dll yep that's the name of the file so under the description of the file it says office 2013 because this file was introduced to office in office 2013 right yeah now your mm -hmm. machine goes and does soft uh, because that's all software inventory is doing it's just doing file scanning and scans this file and says oh i scanned this file and the editor of this file told me it's Office 2013. So Taiwo has Office 2016. Oh, by the way, I read another one that is OFF 
07 and that one says I'm Office 2007 because that file was introduced into Office in 2007 and it's going to report and say yep I've got Office 2007 on my machine also so you're like hold on which is the one is it 2010 is it 2013 is it 2016 <laughs> right yeah. it's because you cannot trust software invent so software inventory also has its own use but the use is not for finding out which software is installed you can trust hardware inventory better than you can trust software inventory okay like the one i did now i did a wmi query right and i yeah. piped it into a text file if you look at the result of that look at this result it's told me the applications installed on my machine it's told me what the guid is so basically you can get the grid for the applications on your machine this way if you want to do installation you know how useful this is for you <laughs> right Tyro? this yeah. is very useful for you if you're doing sscm application deployment or removal you get the grid straight from mm -hmm. here it tells you the application it tells you the grid it tells you where it's installed this is from hardware inventory this is wmi query this is not file scanning. This is I'm telling the machine, tell me what is installed, tell me what the grid is, and the machine is replying to me. From here, you won't find Office 2013 and Office 2010 and Office 2007 here. You only find what has been installed on this machine here. But can, um, does the report in SCCM reporting, does it show the grid also? It can. Okay. For sure, it can. A hundred percent. For I'm example, asking. actually, let me show this to you. So if I go here, install applications. Can you see? Uh, that's, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And that's under hardware inventory. Remember, because right. this information again is coming from other remote programs. Oh. Okay. That's more accurate than I'm scanning the file. Yeah. Uh, David, let me ask you a question. Yes, please. Okay. The product uh, ID. Mm -hmm. The one that determines the degree or what? Yeah. So, yeah, it's the grid. So, the product ID is the grid. Okay. So, yeah. So, the grid is mainly, especially if the machine uses, um, if, if the machine uses MSI installer. So, that's oh. like really gold for applications that use MSI installer. Because any application that uses MSI installer, or most, not all, you can basically uninstall them by using MSI exec forward slash X and just specify the grid in front. So that's like really useful information. You don't have to go dig into registry to dig that up. You can find it on your mesh. You can find it easily from there. So I'm not sure if that is so actually I want I wanted to show you. Let's go to office on my machine. If I go properties, I want to check something. Um so I'm just checking like some of the files. Ah, look at this. Now, which office do you think I have installed on my machine? I have Office 2013 installed on my machine, right? Yeah. So look at this. So if I'm doing file scanning through software inventory, if I double click on this, look at this file here. MSOHEV.dll, right? Properties, yeah. details, because that is what software inventory is reading. And look at file description. 2007 microsoft mm -hmm. office component mm -hmm. okay i've never had office 2007 installed on this machine ever but the file was created in 2006 introduced in office 2007 and is still needed by office 2013 so it exists on my machine so if i'm just doing file scanning using software inventory it will just go and scan this file and report david you have a software called 2007 Microsoft Office Component installed on your machine. I'm not sure if that is that clear at all. No, I get it. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. and that and basically you can look for some of, many of these files and you see, you know, all kinds of different stuff. You know, because that's what all is reading. It's reading the file header information and reporting the file header information to you. So okay, we've beaten that horse to, <laughs> to death, so we know software inventory hardware inventory and uh, so hardware inventory does way much more than just hardware inventory it can tell you the applications that are installed it's actually more accurate than software inventory but in what case will software inventory be useful to us because again like we said software inventory is basically checking file um and their extensions right that you can find on my machine and reporting them 
in what situation do you think I will even need that? Because otherwise, I will say, because, okay, when I went for the Microsoft training, the instructor told us and said, um, software inventory is an old method of, doing, of trying to do uh, software, uh, find out which software is installed on your machines. You know, hardware inventory does a better job. And if you really want to get a really good job, implement asset intelligence. Then you get a really good job of software inventory. So, and in, in uh, the instructor advised us, so I advise you actually just switch off software inventory on your machine. It's not useful, it's useless. Okay, so I got to work like the next week, you know, with all the points listed on my notes. And I talked to the guy that was looking after SSM in our infrastructure. And I was like, hello, Matt. Uh, software inventory, um, I think we should switch it off. Because it's not useful, it's useless. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's not useless. He was like, have you ever deployed an application where you say, the requirement of this application is that there's a file called um, test.exe must exist on the machine. Have you ever done a deployment like that? I say, yes, I do that all the time. For example, I want to do an upgrade on a machine. I say, before you do an upgrade on this machine, check if there's a file called sgn.exe. If that file exists on this machine, then don't do a fresh install, do an upgrade. But I won't be able to do application deployment like this if I don't have software inventory enabled. Is that clear or does anyone have questions regarding that? Well, it's clear to me. I understand. Yeah. It's kind of like de detecting if that exactly. file exists. Exactly. Which I can now use because SSM now has that information of these are the list of X's that exist on this machine. I can now use that information and the location of the X's. I can now use this information in my software deployment. But if okay. I disable software inventory, I won't be able to use requirements like this for my application deployment. David. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, the SGN, that EXE, yeah. it them mean the possibility of you to upgrade a specific software or all the software found in the machine? So uh, it depends on how I'm using it. So let me give you an illustration. So let's bring the server here again. So I go here, I go um, on the software library, create a new application. Uh, create an application. Yeah, um, MSI, whatever. Let's let's use MSI. Let's let's go. Uh, where did I save them? <laughs> I'm sure I've saved them. Okay, I'm sure I, it's been a while. Uh, let's go under the edge drive. Uh, SCCM sources. Uh, properties let me see if i'm sharing this okay yeah there we go that is where i'm sharing this okay so i'll go here paste applications let's see uh, mozilla firefox yeah let me select that okay i've selected that i go that's the application i want to deploy next it finds out the grid and all the stuff for me and I go, yeah, next. Just to show an illustration, I'll delete it straight afterwards. But one of the things I can do with this is you can have something like requirements for certain applications. Uh, come on, go on, finish quickly. I actually have one that I could have used. Uh, quick, quick, quick. So, okay, that one is taking time. Let's go under properties for this one. And if I go under deployment types, so one of the things that, that um, with SCM 2012 that's different from 2007 is this concept called applications, where you could have um, multiple deployment types under a single application. And the advantage of that is for example, I don't have to have a separate package for doing upgrade, a separate package for fresh installation. 
So I can have this and say, um, you know, this is a fresh installation, right? Assuming yeah. the way you up, up, uh, upgrade 7-zip is different from the way you install it. Maybe 7-zip has a requirement that before you do an upgrade, you must first remove an existing one or whatever. So therefore, the deployment type is different from a fresh installation. So I can go and say, I want to add a new deployment type for upgrade. And I can say, um, let's call it whatever. Let's go next, test, next. Uh, content location select whatever just to show what I mean quickly 7z uh, select folder okay install uh, installation program uh, install.exe whatever I'll delete I'll, I won't proceed with this okay so now it says detection method yeah I can specify a detection method so here's one way I can use it so it's saying, how do I detect if this application is installed so that I won't go ahead and install it? So if it's got a grid or a product ID like we saw earlier, I can add a product ID or a Windows installer ID, a product code, add it here. But one thing I can also do is I can use a file system and say, look on the machine in this location, in the C drive, in program files, under 7-zip. If so so and so dot exe, if it exists on the if let's say if this one exists on this machine in this location, that means the application exists. The reason why I can use um, requirements, so it's not actually on the deployment type, but let's say detection rule and go next, go next, go next. So requirement, how do I specify which uh, computers? this application will apply to but again remember this for an upgrade so i can say i only want you to apply this if the if the um, machine has a file like this that that exists on it so i can go under custom create one create a custom global condition and say file system and say i only want you to apply this application to that machine if that machine has a file called so so and so dot exe in this location so the only reason why i can use this condition is because of software inventory i hope i've not confused you now more no yeah Dio, is it clear or is it more confusing now um it's more confusing. because you know i i've uh, performed a couple of uh, uh upgrade mm -hmm. we use a, a soft a software uh, uh, called bellark you run Be bellark okay. yeah yeah it will give you the inventory of all the software you have in the machine yeah and based on that you decide when you want to do the migration or the upgrade mm -hmm. which piece of uh, application you will stay and which one need to be upgraded mm -hmm. so now the way well, you brought that that file you need to be there that's what uh, got me confused ah okay um so like think about it like this way so um um let me put it this way like okay let's create a new whiteboard quickly okay a new whiteboard so i have this machine right so yeah. this is machine a this is machine b machine a and this is machine b now machine b doesn't have doesn't have tests.exe installed at all yeah okay now machine a has tests.exe version 1.0 installed so this company that makes makes this application called test.exe they release a new version called test.exe version 1.2 now the company said now you can to install this on a machine that doesn't have it at all to install on a fresh machine just double click or just say let me just just double click this um, 
test.exe version 1.2 so that's the instructions by the company right that makes this application if this application does not exist on the machine if it's a fresh install just double click dot test exe dot and then it's going to install it right mm -hmm. to upgrade from test 1.0 to test 1.2 <clears throat> install dot net 4.5 and then double click tests 1.2.exe so that's the instruction from them so what that means is that what you want to do on machine b is different from what you want to do on machine a right yeah so you go ahead and you create an application in sccm so this is one single application, right? Mm -hmm. So under the application, you have two deployment type. You have deployment type A. Deployment type A will be the one that will apply to machines that doesn't have test.exe installed already. And what you say is um, just run test.exe run test.exe version 1.2 on machines requirement so how do i know which machines to run test.exe 1.2 on requirement is that tests.exe version 1.0 does not exist on the machine then you have another deployment type under the same application called install and .NET 4.5 and then run tests um, 1.2.exe. Now the requirement for this is that the machine, so when do I know to run B instead of A? This is how you know is that tests 1.0.exe exists on the machine is that clear yeah the reason why we can use this requirement is because we have software inventory enabled because with software inventory we've scanned this machine we know which axes exist in which location therefore we can use that information for our applications okay. but if i disable software inventory i won't have a list there is no way for me to know does test.exe exist on this machine or not in this location is that clear yeah yeah i'm not okay with it right yes yeah okay. so that's so when i came back and i was like yep our instructor said we don't need it the guy was like no <laughs> except you don't want to be deploying applications using this method anymore then you can disable it and i went online to read about it and it was right so that's one of the advantages of software inventory is you can have a you can use this kind of requirement for your application deployment another mm -hmm. advantage which is not really popular is if you're doing a hr review <laughs> so um your HR team comes to Taiwo and they're like, Taiwo, you suspect that Dio has been stealing our company information. So there's this file that was created on the CEO's computer. This file should only be on the CEO's computer. But we believe that Dio act into the CEO's computer and copied this file to his machine. So Taiwo wants you to find out does this file exist on Dio's machine? Taiwo says, what yeah. Dio has changed the name? What? What if Dio has changed the exactly. name? Exactly. So if Dio is like, you know, a really smart guy and Dio has changed the name, now that would, be a, that would mean a separate thing entirely. So you can use this method. But let's okay. say Dio hasn't changed the name. Dio has left the name exactly as it was. Taiwo can be like, yeah, what I can do is this. I can go under client settings where which is where you enable your software hardware inventory so you go under the properties of a client settings 
Tyro can say, okay, um, I'm going to go on the software inventory here. It's enabled. I'm going to say collect files. Or actually, even if Dio has changed the name, so it depends. If Dio has changed the name, but Dio hasn't changed the extension, so you can say, hey, go to all the machines in this hierarchy and look on their hard drives and collect any machine that has .xml for me. And say, hey, if the size is more than this, don't collect it. If this, because otherwise you could fill up your hard drive really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so you so they've given you safeguards so that you don't destroy yourself so you can say okay i don't want to go crazy here i don't want to be collecting one gig xml files if it's more than this forget it but if it's less than you know maybe 500 kb so look on all the machines collect all the xml files where do you want me to search remember again software inventory is file scanning why do you want me to search the entire hard drives or do you want me to just search um you want me to search a particular location i can say hey, the entire hard drive just search for every doctor xml file and send that out so it's going to go on deals machine collect all the dot xml files it's going to save them in this location and if i go to my c drive so the root of where you've installed sccm config manager on the inboxes on the is he on the client services on oh, this hardware inventory? No, under that. Um, yeah, where, where? Oh, yeah, under col file, collect file dot box. So this is where it's going to collect the files and put them here. And then I can go and have a look and see does this file exist on Dio's machine? Yes or no? So that's like one other way. Mm. Uh, so that or that's like another use of that. Okay. But like what I was said, it's not like perfect because if the user has changed the name, changed the extension and all kinds of stuff, then you, you have to use another method, <laughs> not this method. But that's like one of the advantage of that. But one thing mm -hmm. to note is that any file that it collects, um, how, you know, how do you men mention whether it's going to uh, delete them or not you have to set that on that under your site maintenance let me close all this cancel cancel so if i go on the site maintenance and that's where i can specify here delete aged collected file so i can say a hey, because otherwise the files could end there end up being there for a long time so i say a hey, if the file has been there and it's not been accessed for like a long time um leave it alone uh, sorry delete it and do that job every Saturday so I can use that delete aged collected files and also for inventory information I can say and um, delete aged inventory information should be somewhere down here um aged inventory information is that okay yes here we go delete aged inventory history and here's where I can say a hey, um, you're doing hardware inventory because what hardware inventory we do is hardware inventory will keep the last history so it won't keep more than the last history we'll keep the last history of hardware inventory so Tywo can see what this machine's inventory was the last time and if anything has changed from this time but you can specify hey if the inventory has been that way for like a while just delete it after 90 days so, so David yeah it deleted uh, the information from the database um, of the site yeah yes so this is um, site maintenance. So it deletes it directly from the database. Mm. Yeah. So it will be gone completely from database. So that's like where you configure that. So the other thing to note with software inventory is any file that is collected from the user's machines and stored here, the files are not encrypted. So you really don't want to keep them for that long, for so long, if they are sensitive information. So yeah, okay, good one. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, so just to quickly mention, let's let's delete all this. Just to quickly mention a quick way of how like the whole inventory process works. So there are four main uh, components involved. So let's put them down here. So this is the client itself that you're scanning whether for software or hardware. The client is talking to a management point all the time 
then this is the site server and then here's the site database so those are the four components installed so you create the policy on the site server yeah the client eventually comes and requests policy from the management point management point says okay here's your new policy do software inventory every two days do hardware inventory every seven days and report it back to me so on this client they are inventory agents and there, there's like different inventory agents there's like the hardware inventory agent and there's the software inventory agent so the so hardware inventory agent um, if you say do it every seven days it's going to schedule that task so seven days is going to kick it off it's going to collect that information and save it on the computer and show you why it saves it so it's, it doesn't like save it like because you have to be really fast to catch it you put it on the computer and transfers that information to the management point management point gets the information converts the information into a config manager format that the site server can understand so management point gets gets the report from client and then convert it into config manager format for the site server to understand and on the management point you can look under the log um, mp i think is hardware inventory for hardware and another one dot log and you can uh, and you can see when all this is going on when it gets that information from the client when it converts it after it converts it to a format that a config manager can understand it takes that report that the client has sent that it has converted and it drops it into a folder on the site server the folder that it drops it into is this folder on the site server so i'm on the site server now if i go to program files config manager under inboxes under data loader so it drops it inside data loader so once the file gets dropped here the site server will pick that up and then take the information here and store it in the database and you can find that under this process you can find it under data loader dot log for hardware inventory for software inventory under software inventory process dot log so for example we can quickly just go to see previous ones so for example go back to the server if i go to config manager under logs um, data loader is anything that is entered into the database is recorded in data loader dot log and you see that information here so yeah uh, updating inventory reporting views so again the information comes in from the management point get it so you can see here we go so you can see can you see this at all yeah yeah mm -hmm. so it says oh moving me file from c process data loader this one to c art data loader dot box process so basically it moves it from this folder and drops it into the folder process so basically um i'm not sure if that's clear at all <laughs> so it takes so inboxes um data loader so management point drops the file inside here right yeah. um <clears throat> the site server picks it up from here and drops it inside this process folder and then anything inside this process folder will now be recorded so that's what it says here it says i'm moving the file so this file's name is this one dot myth. He said I'm moving it from data loader dot box to data loader dot box for slash process. So then I can begin the processes. So the moment it moves it under the process folder, it begins to store it in database. I can see started the machine myth processing thread, and then it's processing inventory for client LB client one. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because once you understand this process, you can follow it through. So client gets the policy and then starts to scan information of this 
client scanning is in inventory agent.log so you can follow through the logs you know when this client begins to scan it's in inventory agent.log client finishes scanning transfers it to management point you find that information when management point receives it in so basically if you notice inventory agent.log client says yes i've sent the information but then you get to the management point and you don't see any information coming in from that client you know you probably have a network problem so the information is not getting to the management point so again if we go back to the sccm server and this is probably where we'll probably pause for today and if i open on one of my clients let's just go to uh long long dc1 is good let's go to long dc1 um we go open let's go lb dc1 slash c drive i want to go under the windows ccm under logs under inventory agent and you see when the client started processing this so the client so you can see the format that the client the client saves it in this directory c windows ccm inventory temp but it saves it as an xml file config manager takes it and com converts that xml file to a me file so the directory that so hardware inventory does the scan creates a file of what the scan is um puts it in c windows ccm inventory temp the inventory agent takes that file and sends it to the management point so once he sends it so you see um so existing okay no items to collect in this point but whenever it finish collecting items you see what we'll see what what it's gonna do so okay yeah here we go so you see this action here it says successfully sent report destination mp mp underscore h i m v can you see that yeah so it says hey i finished mm -hmm. the task i'm sending it to this management point now if i go to the management point which is this one if i go under the c drive under um is it under the c drive under um where is the log file it's no sms package no it's not um I think it's on the program. Well, okay, under C drive, under program files, under SMS CCM, and I'll see under logs. I'll see MPHIMV. So you can see MPHIMV here, which yeah. is what the client is saying and saying, "Hey, I've finished the report. I've sent the reports to destination my management point, which is the active management point of the client. I've sent it. So you find it in this log mp.himv. So if I go open that log mp.himv, you see, so that was, what time was that? That was, let's go to the client. That was 2301 So 23 today at 2150. So let's go to the server, the HIMV log. Um, again, what time was that? That was 21.50. So let's go. Yeah, 21.50.26. So 21.50.26 was when this guy said, I'm sending it to the management point, right? And straight off on the management point, 21.50.27, we'll see something here. Can you see this? It says, I'm copying attachment to C program files. So basically, it's taking this attachment in and processing xml file can you see that yeah the task start of the process processing the xml file what's the report that i get said delta report from lbdc1 is the report the type of inventory is hardware inventory and you see translate report attachment can you see that so that's where it's converting it from xml to dot mif so now it was xml here before right if you look at this one now it's dot mif it converted it and then the next thing this guy will now do is it will hand it over to the site server so site server will now do the processing and then drop it in the database and then you can view your report so basically just trace and it's the same thing whenever you're doing any troubleshooting just trace it from beginning to the end and just follow the log files 
So, A, what's the first thing that happens? The client does the scan. Where does it log it? It logs it here. Okay, no problems. Find that. And so after it finishes, it should send it over to the management point. And when the management point receives it, where will you log that information in this one? Okay, I've got that. So when my main point finishes, where is it going to drop it? It's going to drop it in this folder here. And then this guy is going to pick it up and log it in this log here. And then whenever this guy is transferring his database, it's going to store that information in this log to let you know I'm now saving it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So any questions regarding this? I think this is where we stop today. We'll pick up next time from Asset Intelligence. So any questions regarding what we've discussed today? Um, no, no questions at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no. Dio, what about you? Any questions? No, I, I got the picture. I think I'll review again to, yeah. so that it can stick in my memory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, just, just again, just uh, one, one thing to do is just look. There's this uh, wonderful stuff from actually Microsoft, uh, Microsoft's documentation will probably give like really good um, configuration manager log files very good documentation with the list of all the log files but then one good thing is i think they if i remember correctly i think they put them into sections yeah so i think they put them into sections so configuration manager site server log files for so if i go control have and search for hardware inventory yeah and basically just look to all the logs that mention hardware inventory so now it says this is Client operation. Client operation for hardware inventory is inventory agent.log. This is where it's going to record activity of hardware inventory, software inventory, heartbeat discovery. So if I go next down, power provider.log, it says records activity, but is this on the client also? Yeah, this on the client also. So basically it tells you all the logs involved. So this one is on the site server. It's telling you this data loader.log. Records information about the processing of management information format files, MIF files, and hardware inventory in configuration manager database. Basically, you just search for which feature you're interested in. It's going to tell you where the log files is on the client, on the management point, on the site server. If I keep going down, I will get to the management point one. Yeah, there we go. Management point log files. Record details about the conversion of XML hardware inventory records from client and the copy of those files to the site server. So basically it's telling you wherever I'm making this step, I'm logging it down somewhere. So then you can find information about what's going on in those logs. So mm -hmm. if you have to troubleshoot, one thing I found out about troubleshooting, the difficult part is mapping out the steps. That's the difficult part. Once you can map out the steps of, this is the process that this guy goes through from point A to point Z, once you can map out that process, then you can troubleshoot because all you need to do is find out where the link got broken in the middle. But the difficult part is understanding the map between point A to point Z. And uh, me, me and Taiwo, we, we, we've dealt with that a lot. Remember the one we we're still looking at with ADFS? Yeah. But that's yeah. the difficult part is we're trying to map out how does this thing go from A to Z, you know? But once we can, if we can figure that out, then we can troubleshoot because all we need to do is follow it step by step and then look for where is the link that got broken in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Okay, then. Nice hanging out with you today. So I'll put the recording up also. Um, on the so next time, page. next Saturday or... Uh, so next week, I'm thinking I'll post on Thursday also. Or what time do you, what time is most best for you guys? Is it Saturday? You prefer Saturday or Thursday? Saturday. Saturday, um, what I will. You prefer Saturday, Saturday or Thursday? Okay. Saturday is better for you too. Yeah, but I was thinking, I don't know, but Saturday, is it, what of 8 o'clock? Is eight, 8 o'clock to... Is 8 o'clock good for you, uh, Dale? I don't mind 8 o'clock. I'm okay with 8 o'clock. 8 afternoon? Uh, yeah. No. So one hour yeah. earlier. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, 8 o'clock next week then. No problem. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah, 8 o'clock will be yeah. cool. Okay. Okay. okay, no problem. Have a wonderful weekend, man. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll speak to you later. Yeah. Bye.